Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. This is a revised version of a previous video in which I've made some corrections. Previously, I relied heavily on a news story which did not accurately reflect the intentions of the scientists. This version corrects that. We're always being told how important it is to listen to climate scientists. So in this video, we're going to do exactly that. Here's a story which came out yesterday. Earth needs fewer people to beat the climate crisis, scientists say. We declare, with more than 11,000 scientists' signatories from around the world, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency, the scientists wrote in a stark warning published Tuesday in the journal Bioscience. There needs to be far fewer humans on the planet. So according to Bloomberg, these 11,000 scientists believe that billions of people need to be removed from the planet. In the bioscience article, the scientists said they want to accomplish this strictly via voluntary measures. Now let's take a closer look at what these scientists perceive to be the problem. Almost all of the world's population growth is occurring in Africa. So these 11,000 scientists, by implication, are targeting the African people. The population of Nigeria is expected to increase by more than 500 million people by the end of the century. Let's do the population math. In order to voluntarily reduce Earth's population by 75%, you would have to get half of young couples to agree to having no children and the other half to agree to having only one child. This obviously is not going to happen. And even if it could happen, it would take decades for the population decline to begin. Climate alarmists say that we only have about a decade left. The world's population has been steadily increasing, and there's never been a case when people have voluntarily massively reduced their own population. It should be obvious to any thinking person that there is no practical way to massively reduce Earth's population voluntarily. The only times in world history when populations have been rapidly reduced have been due to disease, hunger, or genocide and these signatories say they don't support any of those concepts. Yet this wasn't always the case in the scientific community. The timing of the news story is very appropriate because it comes on the 50th anniversary of scientists wanting to poison the food and water supply of third world countries in order to keep their population down. New York Times, November 25th, 1969. A sterility drug in food is hinted. Biologist stresses need to curb population growth. San Francisco, November 24th. A possibility that the government might have to put sterility drugs in reservoirs and in food ship to foreign countries to limit human multiplication was envisioned today by a leading crusader on the population problem. The crusader, Dr. Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University, among a number of commentators who called attention to the population crisis, as the United States Commission for UNESCO opened its 13th national conference here today. Putting substances in the food and water supply which damage people's bodies could only be considered poisoning. Let's think about the context of this meeting. This was a meeting of the United Nations where they were talking about poisoning the food and water supply of third world countries. Most people outside of the academic community would consider that sort of crazy talk to be rather disturbing. I find it incredible that the New York Times and the United Nations were willing to entertain this idea. And it should not be surprising that Paul Ehrlich was one of the signatories of the new letter. However, Ehrlich's proposal to poison the food and water supply wasn't the only thing he was up to at the time. This was also right around the time when Dr. Ehrlich and his close associate, Dr. John Holdren, who went on to be Obama's science advisor, were pushing global cooling and a new ice age. New York Times, September 29, 2009. As a longtime student of John P. Holdren's gloomy visions of the future, like his warnings about global famines and resource shortages, I can't resist passing along another one that's just been dug up. This one was made in 1971, long before Dr. Holdren became President Obama's science advisor. In the 1971 essay, Overpopulation and the Potential for Ecocide, Dr. Holdren and his co-author, the ecologist Paul Ehrlich, warned of a coming ice age. So in 1971, these academics not only believed we were having a population crisis, but also a climate crisis too. 
The difference being that the 1971 crisis was global cooling rather than global warming. And they believed that the government needed to poison the food and water supply in order to keep the Earth's population down. We've already seen some rather remarkably dangerous academic insanity, but it goes on. Here's another interesting article from 1974. Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich, author of the highly successful book The Population Bomb, is an immensely likable guy. He's also deeply concerned about the fate of the planet and all of its inhabitants. Paul Ehrlich has noticed yet another dark cloud on the horizon. Reed Bryson and some other climatologists are now pretty certain that the climate we experienced from 1930 to 1960 was the peak of a 1,000 year warm cycle. The world will not enjoy weather as good again for another 100 decades. This means that the drought now spreading across the Sub-Sahara, the late spring in our own Midwest, the increasingly chancy character of India's monsoon rains, and other isolated weather events may not be so isolated after all. These words all sound very familiar. 45 years ago, the academic community was expressing exactly the same concerns about climate and overpopulation. Only back then they were talking about global cooling rather than global warming. And the press described Dr. Ehrlich, who wanted to poison the third world, as an immensely likable guy who cared about all of the Earth's inhabitants. Now let's go back to the original article. Forty years ago, scientists from 50 nations converged on Geneva to discuss what was then called the CO2 climate problem. At the time, with reliance on fossil fuels having helped trigger the 1979 oil crisis, they predicted global warming would eventually become a major environmental challenge. We've seen the current claim about 40 years ago. Now let's go back in time 40 years and see what was actually going on. March 9, 1980, new ice age may soon grip cooling Earth. Something strange is happening to weather throughout the world. Chills and droughts in recent years have hit not only here, but also in Europe, Africa, Asia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Even near the equator in subtropical Brazil, where winter supposedly never comes, snow and frost repeatedly have devastated the coffee plantations and sent world prices for coffee beans soaring. The weather patterns of our planet are becoming unstable, the National Academy of Sciences warned in 1975. That's quite a different story from the Bloomberg article from yesterday. Climate alarmists are counting on the fact that most people don't remember the past. Now let's look at some other things from Dr. Ehrlich's past. October 6, 1970. Ehrlich predicts that the oceans will be as dead as Lake Erie in less than a decade. America will be subject to water rationing by 1974 and food rationing by 1980. Well, none of those things happened, and now we're having an obesity crisis instead. It's impressive how Dr. Ehrlich managed to get everything exactly backwards. Here's another article about Dr. Ehrlich from November 17, 1967. Already too late. Dire famine forecast by 75. It's already too late for the world to avoid a long period of famine, a Stanford University biologist said Thursday. Paul Ehrlich said the time of famines is upon us. It will be at its worst and most disastrous by 1975. He said the population of the United States is already too big, that birth control may have to be accomplished by making it involuntary and by putting sterilizing agents into staple foods and drinking water and that the Roman Catholic Church should be pressured into going along with routine measures of population control. So this academic whom the press described as an immensely likable guy was pushing the idea of forced sterilization and poisoning people's food and water. In 1969, Paul Ehrlich told the New York Times, the trouble with almost all environmental problems is that by the time we have enough evidence to convince people, you're dead. We must realize that unless we're extremely lucky, everybody will disappear in a cloud of blue steam in 20 years. So Paul Ehrlich's position was that unless we poison large numbers of people, everybody is going to end up dead, disappear in a cloud of blue steam by the year 1989. Another important part of Ehrlich and Holdren's solution to the population crisis and the global cooling crisis was to shut down the U.S. energy supply. August 11, 1975, by John P. Holdren. The United States is threatened far more by the hazards of too much energy too soon than by the hazards of too little too late. 
Aldrin was a professor at Berkeley, and Ehrlich is a professor at Stanford University, both located in Northern California, where currently people do not have enough electricity because the government is cutting off their electricity supply. And remember that John Holdren went on to be Barack Obama's science advisor. In this video of Obama from 2008, you can see how Holdren was influencing his thinking. Under my plan uh, of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Even you know, regardless of what I say about whether coal is good or bad, because I'm capping greenhouse gases, coal power plants, you know, natural gas, you name whatever the plants were, whatever the industry was, they would have to uh, retrofit their operations. That will cost money. They will pass that money on to consumers. There's no better way to shut down the U.S. energy supply than to make it too expensive for middle class and poor people, as Obama said he wanted to do. Making fuel too expensive for people to heat their homes or giving them a choice between heating their homes and feeding their children would cause tremendous harm and likely death to a lot of people. During the 1970s, a large group of scientific signatories sent a letter to President Nixon warning of a new ice age in about a century. And NASA's leading climatologists, Russell and Schneider, predicted a new ice age as early as 2021. Ehrlich got all of his prior eco-catastrophe predictions wrong and was promoting poisoning huge numbers of people. But by 1997, he was calling essential trace gas carbon dioxide a poison and saying it was criminal to not believe his global warming scam. It's amazing that someone who had been promoting poisoning the food and water supply would label essential life-giving gas carbon dioxide as a poison. And he called other people criminal for providing the energy which the population needs to survive. The academic community turned on a dime switching from the global cooling scam to the global warming scam. In 1989, the United Nations said that entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if global warming is not reversed by the year 2000. In 1988, experts said that the Maldives would be completely drowned within 30 years, which would have been last year. And they also said that the Maldives would run out of drinking water by the year 1992. And meanwhile, back in the real world, the Maldives are prospering, opening up five new airports this year alone. Not too bad for a place which was, according to experts, supposed to be underwater last year. I took this picture up at the National Center for Atmospheric Research earlier today. Note the text I've got highlighted. Some entire island nations will be submerged. This is the same text which the UN used in 1989 when they said we only had until the year 2000 to save these nations from being drowned. Climate scientists seem to be completely oblivious to their past failures and incapable of learning from their own history and their own mistakes. But this may have been the most disturbing exhibit at the National Center for Atmospheric Research today. It says that you choose the climate future by the choices that you make. These were some of the choices they gave you. They want you to give up your meat, they want you to give up your car, and they want you to give up your vacations and plane travel. So why are climate scientists trying to control your diet, your vacation, and your travel? This notice I got from the American Association for the Advancement of Science gives us a good hint. They want rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. It should be obvious by now that this is not about climate. It's about people who want to control every aspect of your life. They've been doing this for a very long time. This 30-year-old article from the Canberra Times shows us exactly the same thing. Governments must yield national sovereignty to multilateral authorities able to enforce laws across environmentally invisible frontiers if the greenhouse effect which threatens the future of whole nations is to be overcome the Commonwealth Secretary General said on Tuesday. A Commonwealth expert group set up to look at climate change estimates there's a 90% certainty that the planet would become warmer by at least 1 to 2 degrees, perhaps much more, and that sea levels would rise by between 1 and 4 meters by the year 2030. So they were 90% certain that we were going to get between 3 and 12 feet of sea level rise by the year 2030. I think we can be 100% certain that these people's agenda was not about climate, but rather was about social engineering. There is no man-made climate crisis. 
Geologists such as myself know that there's no such thing as an extinction crisis caused by carbon dioxide. The greatest explosion of life on Earth occurred 540 million years ago when CO2 levels were more than 15 times higher than they are now. Life loves CO2. And the reason we have all of these coal beds now is because at the beginning of the Carboniferous era, there was lots of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which stimulated growth and produced massive peat beds, which later turned into coal. These 11,000 academics who are terrified of carbon dioxide are not very good scientists. Actual scientists know that there's no such thing as a CO2-driven extinction crisis, and that carbon dioxide is extremely good for life. Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. The absurdity is the climate crisis, and the atrocity is the hysteria which has occurred as a result of scientists promoting the imaginary climate crisis. These academics who are promoting the fake climate crisis are losing control of their own agenda. They tell people that we need to massively reduce the Earth's population or the entire ecosystem will collapse. Yet they don't provide a practical solution for doing that. So the hysterical mobs they have created are taking things into their own hands. Here's a tweet from today showing exactly what I'm talking about. Dear Nature, we're done reading the mansplaining trash from myopic white bros who do not speak for those on the front lines. Michael Mann has been and continues to be problematic and dated. Publishing his mediocrity isn't a good look. Michael Mann was a key player in creating the global warming hysteria. And he's lost control of the angry mob he created. They've started ridiculing him. The angry mob has seized control of the agenda. History shows us that once the angry mob takes over, there's no limit to the level of atrocities which can occur. These academics have made a huge miscalculation. George Orwell said, Some ideas are so wrong that only a very intelligent person could believe them. President Eisenhower warned us about this phenomenon almost 60 years ago. In his farewell speech where he warned about the military-industrial complex, he also warned about science being hijacked by political interests. Eisenhower said, The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. That's exactly what we have going on now. We have academics who want to control every aspect of your life and say that survival of the planet depends on massively reducing the Earth's population. And we're not allowed to discuss it because they say that we lack the academic qualifications which are necessary to participate in the discussion. It's difficult to imagine anything more reprehensible or fundamentally un-American than what is going on now with this climate nonsense. More than a dozen people were executed at the Salem witch trials because of the accusations of a child and because of the judgment of a group of Harvard-educated judges. Does anything sound familiar about that to you? Well, it should because it's very similar to the situation we have in the year 2019. It's very important that we listen to the academics. They're telling us exactly what they want to do, and it's not good. I'm going to finish up with one more important Orwell quote. So much of left-wing thought is a kind of plane with fire by people who don't even know that fire is hot. These academics with their global warming scam and their calls for massive reductions of Earth's population have absolutely no clue how dangerous a game it is that they're playing. Please help get the word out by subscribing to my YouTube channel and following me on Twitter. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.